All right, beautiful. Thank you, Summer. Uh, David, alcoholic. And with me uh, is the other David, also an alcoholic. All right, guys, we're going to jump right in. And um, if you weren't here earlier, say a quick prayer for uh, Max, the wife of one of our members with us here tonight, is in the hospital, George's wife. So everybody, quick prayer for Max, okay? And Steve's still going through a bunch of health stuff too. So everybody, while you're in the thinking of and praying mood, send some good juju out to Steve as well. All right, we are in the doctor's opinion. Woo, we're writing some of the best stuff. So we're going to pick back up on Roman numeral 28. That's XXVIII in the fourth edition. <laughs> if you have a third edition or one of those third edition study guides, it's going to be uh, Roman numeral 26, which is XXVI. And we are we just completed the second paragraph last week that ended with if they are to recreate their lives. So we're going to pick up paragraph number three, Roman numeral 28. We're ready? All right. And as, as always, I'm going to ask, I think selfishly, if you can come on camera, please come on camera. If you're indecent or it's just not a good idea, we get it. But we just always love to see your faces if we can. Here we go. If any feel that a psychiatrist directing a hospital for alcoholics, we appear somewhat sentimental, let them stand with us a while on the firing line. See the tragedies, the despairing wives, the little children. Let the solving of these problems become a part of their daily work and even of their sleeping moments. And the most cynical will not wonder that we have accepted and encouraged this movement. We feel after many years of experience that we found nothing which has contributed more to the rehabilitation of these men than the altruistic movement now growing up among them. So if you remember where we are, right, we're, 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 we're in, the, in the doctor's opinion here, and we had just talked last week about the doctor was really presenting to us the first sort of glimpse at the physical uh, allergic reaction, the physical part of our illness. And I love how, you know, he went on after we really got into that in paragraph one, paragraph two, he's saying, listen, when we break out, if the real alcoholic breaks out in your allergic reaction, and the phenomenon of craving kicks in, frothy emotional appeal seldom suffices. That means all the love, all the outpouring, uh, all of the bargaining, all the negotiation from other humans just doesn't work. It can, I cannot abruptly stop drinking. Right? And now I love how he's really piling on here in this paragraph. And I was trying to give some sort of a feeling and emphasis as I was reading this because he's kind of calling out the rest of the medical industry. He's saying, hey, all you doctors out there, all you haters, as we'd say today, that are questioning, you know, our understanding of this illness and what these people who are recovered are trying to do, he's saying, come get in our shoes. Come get on the firing line, he says. Get in the midst of these families that are falling apart and dying. You know, help these dying alcoholics that can't stop, can't control. They're absolutely killing themselves. Come here and see if this is about sentimentality or see if this is really about an illness that is killing them. It's not a choice they're making. And how finally there might be a practical solution that works. Sam, you want to go ahead and do a definition? I know you got one for sure. Please. No, don't. Go ahead then, David, if you got it. Okay, that's fine. All right. So, uh, yeah, as David pointed out there, so we, we, the, the doc, doctor describes to us what happens to us when we put alcohol in our bodies that will forever have this allergy that we break out in. But then now he's talking, he is writing this to the psychiatrist and says, let them stand on, uh, stand with us on the, on, is a while on the firing line. See the tragedies of sparing wives and little children. My illness was chronic and progressive. It affected my family gravely. It, it says, let let the solving of these problems become part of their daily work. So again, they're preaching to the whole staff of whoever's doing the psychiatry uh, um, related to alcoholism here. But as I go down to the bottom of the page there, it says, we feel that many years of experience, so this is his experience of many years, and his experience of working with over 40,000 other drunks and drug addicts, a lot of experience this man has contributed to more of the real potation of these men than the altruistic movement now growing up among them. So this selfless 
ness that he's recognizing that we as alcoholics must give of ourselves to save our own lives. We must give this away if we're going to keep this. And he's, he's experiencing this because a doctor's firm, he can't do anything for us. There's nothing he can do to fix us. There's no pill for that. There's no fix for that. It has to be a psychic change. We'll get into that a little bit in the next mm-hmm. paragraph or the next page. So this is what the doctor's setting us up for and also preaching to his comrades. Yeah, I mean, that, and that's really going to get underscored on the next page. He, he's all, good, all but going to say, no solution here, right? These guys need something else. Moving on. Okay. Actually, let's not move on yet. Let's, let's recap and recap and recap to make sure we're real clear where we are here. So at the top of the page, again, talking about the physical portion of our illness, and how we have an allergic reaction to alcohol. That allergic reaction, that abnormal reaction, is that we break out in this phenomenon of craving. And if you weren't here last week or you're not familiar with the phenomenon of craving, according to the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it's that when I have a drink, I put it in my body, my body says, I need a second, and then I need a third, and then I need a fourth. It's not about me choosing keep, to keep drinking until I'm wasted. It's that my body cries out and demands that I keep pouring alcohol into it, right? And I'm guessing all of you here are very familiar with that phenomenon of craving, having fallen prey to it many times, right? So <clears throat> if we understand this, and every time David and I go to treatment center, we, we always we start with this exact page right here. We start with that top paragraph on 28 to describe, you know, the physical uh, part of the illness. And everybody gets it after we talk through it for five minutes. And we say, so guys, if you have this experience like we do, if you put one in your body, you end up expect to have two and you end up having 22. We know what the solution is. Just don't put alcohol in your body, right? Anybody here, show of hands if you're up for it. Anyone try to not put alcohol in your body after bad stuff happened? Yeah. Anybody try that 10,000 times? Yeah. Everybody else start drinking again 10,001 times. Yes. Why? Why do we always pick up again when bad stuff happens, when we drink, when we break out in craving? Here is why. Now at the bottom of the page, we're going to talk about, in brief, the second part of our illness. This is where we are mentally ill. Now, many of us are mentally ill in multiple ways, right? I'm not being an amateur psychiatrist here, and I'm not using this in any sort of pejorative way, right? Mental obsession, mental compulsion, right? Well, we're going to learn about exactly what that means and what that looks like as a real alcoholic. And if you haven't heard us say this before, this expression, real alcoholic, is not something we're using to be cute. This is an expression that's used in the big book, the real alcoholic, the true alcoholic, which means someone who suffers from all three illnesses, the physical, the mental, and the spiritual. So I'm going to ask that question that was not entirely rhetorical. If I know when I pick up a drink, I'm going to break out in craving and bad stuff's going to happen, why do I pick up another drink? This paragraph is going to start to explain why. So this first sentence, this isn't just about us. This is about everybody. What is the sentence? It says men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. Okay. (laughs) I drink for the effect produced on the 13th drink, not the first one. I don't even like the taste of the first one necessarily, but I also know that that's my solution. So Joe and Charlie give a really good analogy of that too. So I drank for the effect produced, but if I'm really thirsty, there's nothing better than cold, cool spring water, right? But I've never sat down and drank a whole case of cold, cool spring water either. But boy, once I put that in my body, because what we learned earlier on in the chapter in the, on the page is I broke out in craving. I have no control over the amount I'm going to drink now. Now we're going to start talking about why don't I have choice? I'm not going to have a choice whether or not I pick up. So we're getting into the obsession here. Anybody married here to a normie? Anybody have normal kids, normal parents, normal friends? What happens when they have a drink? They have a drink, maybe they finish it. And why did they want to have the drink? They wanted the effect produced. Rough day at the office, wanted to relax a little. Maybe they're shy, they want to go out dancing, want to be a better dancer, have a couple of cocktails. People drink because they want to produce an effect, right? Right be more romantic, feel sexier, feel stronger, you know, 
all of the above, confidence to go talk to somebody romantically. We want the effect produced. Moving on to the next sentence, though, for the real alcoholic, for the real addict, is the context for the next sentence. The sensation, the sensation or the effect produced that I want, the sensation is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, they cannot, after a time, differentiate the true from the false. So the effect produced is what I want. I had a rough week at work. I want to go to happy hour at six o'clock on Friday, and I want to have a couple of stiff drinks. Why? Because I want to feel better. I want to get just to cop a little bit of buzz, and it's my reward for the end of the week. But guess what happens? That sensation, the effect that I want produced, is going to elude me. Do you guys know what it means for something to elude me? And Sam, maybe if you can grab the, the dictionary definition of elusive, but I'm going to give you my sort of ad hoc one. I, I can't quite grab it. I can't quite control it. I can't quite grasp it. The sensation, the effect produced that I want as a real alcoholic eludes me. Why? Because I wanted the two drinks. I wanted the effect produced from those two drinks. But guess what happened after I had the first drink? I broke out in the phenomenon of craving. And the feeling that I was hoping I'd get from two Goes by so quickly because before I know it, I've had eight, I've had 18, I've had 80. Okay, maybe not 80, but I've had way too many and I overshot the mark because my body cried out, it broke out in craving, and I, it, it eluded the way I wanted to feel I could not capture it. And then this goes on to say, while they admit it's injurious, they cannot after a time differentiate the truth from the false. Guys, this is the essence, this statement of alcoholic insanity. So in the second step, and I'm not jumping too far ahead, but most of you I'm sure are familiar with 12 steps, at least in the summary form from the book or on the wall, right? Where we're restored to sanity, you know, that we're conceptually restored to sanity. I'm not, and the step is not, and I'm not talking about a restoration of sanity from all the quote unquote crazy foolish things we've done. We have all done wild, outrageous things that many normal people would say that is crazy. What we're talking about with sanity, or the lack of sanity, is how our brain reacts to the thought of when I want to pick up a drink in the face of bad things, consequences happening. Here's my story I always tell. When we were talking before the meeting never letting the facts get in the way of a good story. So this is a little bit of fabricated, but there's plenty of truth in it. And I'm sure you'll agree. So it's Friday. I had a rough week. I'm a raging alcoholic. I call my girlfriend and say, I'm going to go to happy hour, six o'clock with my coworkers. I'm going to have two drinks, but I'll be home by eight o'clock. If you want to make dinner, we'll have dinner. We'll watch a movie together. Anybody ever make a promise like that? I made many promises like that. Yeah. Guess what happens by 6.01? After I've had my first drink, I break out in craving. Do I make it home by 8 p.m.? Hell to the no, right? Because the effect produced that I wanted, the sensation I wanted, eluded me. I broke out in craving after the first drink, and I got wasted. So I didn't get home for the romantic dinner and a movie. Instead, what happened is I touched some woman in the bar inappropriately. Her boyfriend punches me in the face. The doorman grabbed me and threw me out, opening the exit door with my skull. And I finally make it home at 2 a.m., six hours late, where I'm locked out of my apartment and I got to sleep it off in the hallway. This is terribly injurious. And then when I come to on Saturday at some point, and, and Bert calls me and says, dude, rough one last night, David. Uh, and I'm like, yeah, I'm in trouble. Old lady's kind of pissed at me. He's like, well, Bert says, let's go out tonight. A little hair of the dog to bitch you. And I'm like, no, 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 if that's a good idea. And he's like, dude, two drinks. I got your back. I'll make sure you're home early. And what does my brain think? Bert's right. I'm going to go out for two drinks and I'll get home unscathed tonight. Why? Because while they admit it's injurious, last night was injurious. They cannot, after a time, differentiate the truth from the false. I don't have an argument with myself. I don't have a pro-con list. My brain says, tonight's going to be different. That's the false. Because what happens when Bert and I go out that night? The same thing that happened the night before, or possibly worse. So 
So the doctor is building on something here that this disease that we have is internal at the same time. So is the solution guys. It is not an external solution and it is not an external problem. It's not the color of my skin, the nationality, my religion, um, my sexual orientation had nothing to do with why I'm an alcoholic. They're telling us that once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Once I put drink in my body, I break out a craving. And here I'm talking about the sensation of the soul loses that they admit it's injurious. They would point injurious means likely to cause damage or harm. I just ended up in front of the judge last Friday. And he told me if you show up in my courtroom one more time, I'm going to give you the maximum sentence for the crimes that you commit. And then Friday night, I'm out drinking again. I can't tell the different differentiate the true from the false. I have no control choice whether or not I pick up that drink or not. No power, no choice, no control. And I pick it up and I'm back in the cycle, the spree and the cycle of remorse that I go into all the time. And now I got to go back to the house again. And now my, I pull up in the driveway and my wife's having a yard sale with all my clothes out front. The locks are changed on my doors. I can't get in. I haven't been home for three days. I haven't changed clothes for three days. There's somebody else's clothes in the back seat. It's, just, it's, it's an ugly thing. But I couldn't, if I would, I could not ma- navigate the truth out of that thing. I could not understand. And that's why it's so important for me to, as a recovered alcoholic and drug addict, that I talk to people and qualify them in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous immediately. Howard brings this up all the time. We have a short window. We don't even know what that looks like. We don't know how long we got. At that meeting, if they showed up, let's find out if they're interested, if they want to be qualified. And if they do, let's qualify them. Let's start with this page. You can start with any page you want to go. This is David and Ryan's favorite. And we qualify them to find out if they have this illness. And if they do, great, because we've got a great solution for this. And we're going to get to it on the next page. So I saw lots of nodding heads as I was telling the slightly farcical story, because everyone here has got crazy stories like that. But the next line speaks to this so well, too. To them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. Guys, when I found myself in injurious scenarios like that, I I didn't know that I could avoid those traps. This was just my life. This was my pattern of behavior. This was my reaction to situations. This was my injurious experience that when I drank, I drank too much, and I got into trouble. And I just thought that was my life. To me, the alcoholic life was the only normal one, seemed to be the only normal one. So why, what causes that mental triggering, right? This, so the solution, and we'll get into this much later, you know, we've got these 12 steps and we work them and we can sort of continuously work them. It's very cyclical, but our experience of the illness of alcoholism, of addiction is very, very cyclical as well. And each part sort of begets the effect of the next. So like I said, if I know the solution, because I'm going to break out and craving when I put drink, my body is not to have a drink, but I just don't have a drink problem is I got this mental obsession, this compulsion that tells me to pick up. So the mental sort of causes the physical, right? If I didn't have the mental part, probably I wouldn't pick up. I'd be able to have a sane perspective when it occurred to me to have a drink or someone suggested it. What gets the mental part going? What gets the mental part going is the third way in which we're ill. And and guys, for my money, this is my opinion. This is what it's all about. This is my biggest problem. I'm bound here with you guys because we all share many characteristics and we came in wanting to put the drink down for sure. The physical and the physical powerlessness, the mental powerlessness, those are problems. My primary problem is that I'm spiritually ill. And the doctor just starts to shade into this a little bit, what it looks like. And we're going to get into it so much later, especially on page 52. What is it like? to have an unmanageable life as described in the first step after the dash, right? That our lives have become unmanageable. What does it look like to be spiritually ill, to have a spiritual malady? These are all euphemisms, expressions for the same concept. Let me jump in real quick. Please. So how many times have we gone to meetings and someone says in the meetings, just don't drink and go to meetings. That's a message to my body, guys. Just don't drink and go to meetings. Well, or don't drink no matter what. Now that's a message in my mind. And I'm sitting there as a recovered alcoholic and the top of my head wants to blow off. 
because I can't differentiate the truth from the false. Uh, and uh, my alcoholic life seems like the only normal one. I don't know that there's another life. My job, my responsibility as a recovered alcoholic is to give that man, after I qualify him, a vision for what his life can look like. It's going to, because I'm going to share with, I'm going to listen to what he's got to say a little bit, but I'm going to share with him what my life looks like. Because I think there's a chapter in the back of the book for a reason, a vision for you. I need to have, give that guy a vision. Why would he come back? First of all, he doesn't know what questions to ask. Secondly, I'm going to qualify him so he has a better understanding. And then I'm going to take my time with him, not a lot of time, to get him through this work, to find out what that solution is, watch his life change right in front of his very eyes. Then he'll be able to differentiate the truth from the false, which is the second step. Candidly, the power greater myself can restore me to sanity so I can have some clear thinking. I can be placed in a position of neutrality. Anybody wake up this morning placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected? I did all day long. Man, what that you hear the grace in that? There's a lot of grace in that. It's full of grace. That's the kind of vision I want to make sure he understands that he's going to get. I think it's that vital to give them something to hit because I come in as a hopeless variety. And what's the opposite of hopeless? Hope. And hope was described to me when I first got sober as a vision beyond my present circumstances. And man, my alcoholic life was the only one that I knew. I had no hope. I had no vision beyond my present circumstances. I was in a psych ward. I'm going to go to prison. I'm going to lose my family. Dude, where's the hope in any of that? Well, I call someone in Alcoholics Anonymous and ask for help. My life has never been the same ever again. They learned how to follow directions, which saved my life. So this next sentence, see if you relate to this. When I'm stone cold, physically sober, not recovered, but when I'm physically sober, when I don't have any alcohol or other drugs in my body, or if I got a process addiction, I'm not in the midst of that overeating, gambling, spending, etc. When I'm not in my vice, they are restless, irritable, and discontented. Restless, right? Fidgety. I can't quite sit still. Irritable. Always on the edge of anger, ready to blow up at any second, discontented, unhappy, uncomfortable, angry, unhappy. They're restless, irritable, and discontented unless, unless they can again experience the sense of ease and comfort, which comes at once by taking a few drinks, drinks which they see others taking with impunity. So I'm restless, I'm irritable, and I'm, I'm, di- I'm, dis- you know, I'm uncomfortable, I'm angry, I'm unhappy. Unless I can just start to get this. And I don't even get real ease and comfort. I, I just get the sense of it, right, by the time I'm in full-blown alcoholism. And, and David and I have talked about this a lot, too. I'm not even sure the sense of ease and comfort comes from taking those first few drinks. Well, we're in agreement. The sense of ease and comfort is like the first crack of the bottle. Or the first slide of the cocktail across the bar, right? Or when I'm when I'm home from the spot and I lock the door and I turn off the phone and I got my bag and it's sitting on the counter before I get into it. Because as soon as I get into anything, it's all downhill in a hurry. I don't get any ease and comfort. I have moments of ease and comfort when I got and I'm about to get, right? And then it goes on to say, drinks which they see others taking with impunity, impunity means no punishment. Again, these are the normies in our lives. These are our friends that we went out with at happy hour. When they told their wives and husbands they'd be home by 8 o'clock, guess what happened? They made it home by 8 o'clock. They did not run into anything injurious. They made a commitment. They didn't break out in craving. They went home. We ended up with lots of punity, lots of punishment, because we broke out in the phenomenon of craving. So meetings of alcoholics and as when I first got sober, and this is not true for all, but for most, when we come to meetings, restless, sitting in a meeting, shaking my legs uncontrollably, yeah. <laughs> the whole table's moving. It's like everybody's like, dude, relax. And some nice little lady puts her hand on my legs, says, settle down, baby, settle down, it's okay. And then about three seconds later, I can't sit still again, I'm restless. I, I got to go. You don't understand. I got a busy life. Well, you're living in your car. How busy can you possibly be? It's like, come on. So, but irritable. Everybody's pissing me off. She looks at me the wrong way. My boss, he always gives me the worst jobs at work all the time. 
People in traffic, everybody's irritating the living heck out of me. I'm discontented, like never satisfied with whatever comes my way. So I have, a, I have normal reaction to drinking. I also, this is when I'm so cold sober, I have an abnormal reaction to abstinence too. So this is the cause of what my abstinence looks like when I'm not drinking without a solution, a spiritual solution in my mind. But boy, my mind is so conditioned to remember what works. Alcohol and cocaine are my solutions until they weren't one day. And then when I pick up, I can't differentiate the truth from the false. I don't have to. I don't come home for three days. I go back to jail. All those things, those consequences in my life are not the reason why I'm an alcoholic. And the reason why I'm an alcoholic is because without my consent, without my permission, I pick up a drink and then I break out in craving. And I suffer from this malady that we haven't got to yet. So. And I see other people's dr drinking with taking these things with impunity, with no punishment. Like guys that I, I grew up with, they just, they, they can have a couple, three or four go home. So then all I do is move down the bar a little farther. I just go to the dope house and hang out by myself. Or I go down to somebody's basement who I don't know. That's what I do. Because with me, alcoholic life is the only one that I know. So the sense of ease and comfort that comes with the first one really comes with before I take the first one. Chris Raymer gives a good example. I remember him talking about this one time, staying at the 7-Eleven, going to the cooler and getting his beer. And waiting in line, the sense of eating comfort goes pretty soon. I'll be at the front of the line and I'll be able to get that drink, right? Get that? I do. I get that. But man, when it's not my solution anymore and I'm placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected, I don't have to, I stop fighting everything and everyone, even alcohol. That is the last thing in that sentence. So here, this sort of cyclical nature gets, gets summed up as we keep reading because it goes on to say, we're on top of uh, Roman numeral 29 now. After they have succumbed to the desire again, as so many do, because we're mentally powerless, and the phenomenon of craving develops, because we're physically powerless, we have an allergic reaction, we break out in the phenomenon of craving. They pass through the well-known stages of a spree, it means like a binge, a run, a drunkenness. Emerging remorseful with a firm resolution not to drink again. I love this. Anybody else? Weekend warrior? That was kind of my way. Although the weekends tended to get longer, right? Started on Thursdays and sometimes Wednesdays, right? So Sunday, I would come to around 7 o'clock at night. And, I, you know, you guys you do this. You talk to yourself in the third person in the mirror, like, David, you're smarter than this. David, you're stronger than this. You're not going to do this again. And hook me up to a lie detector, to a polygraph, and I would have passed with flying colors. Firm resolution not to do it again. But it's Sunday night. It's 7 o'clock. And then what happens is one of my buddies calls and says, dude, Sunday night football. Kickoff's in a half an hour. We're at the bar down around the corner, which in the throes in my heyday towards the end, there is this bar right around the corner from my condo, not two blocks away. I was an absolute regular there. So after that weekend and after that firm resolution, my high resolve lasted minutes. And that happened to me time and again. 10,000 times I said I wouldn't do that again. And 10,001 times I did it again. Because my word's pretty lousy about when it comes to not drinking and not drugging. This is repeated over and over and over and over and over. And unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there's very little hope of his recovery. Woof. So, little sneak preview here. I'm doomed if I don't have some sort of psychic change. Right? If the stuff inside of me, especially in my brain, doesn't start to get changed, there's going to be very little hope for me. But if you turn that doom statement around, what does this suggest? This suggests that if I do have an entire psychic change, then there's going to be great hope for my recovery. I know, Sam, you got a bunch of words, so let's yield the floor to you here. Yes. Hi, guys. Uh, I do have some words that were suggested for me to define from the last paragraph before this, before we get into the one that we're on right now. Um, so uh, I had psychiatrists, but I wanted to go 
the or a psychologist, not psychiatrist, right? Psychologist, psychiatrist. Oh my goodness, I'm all messed up here with my words. <laughs> That's my only job for this. Anyway, um, psychology I wanted to define basically is the science which treats of the mind, its powers, functions, and acts. The scientific investigation of of the phenomena of consciousness and behavior. So psychiatrists and um, I believe are just ones versed in psychology. Um, and then that was for the last paragraph. And then I wanted to reiterate altruistic. So I have altruism, which is unselfish interest in others. So uh, we feel after many years of experience that we have found nothing which has contributed more to the rehabilitation of these men than the altruistic unselfish interest in others movement now growing up among them. So that's for that paragraph. And then we'll get into the last paragraph on 28. Um, I had elusive, which um, in the 1938 uh, Webster Dictionary, it is described as baffling and hard to understand. So hard to grasp, just like David said. Um, the sensation so baffling that while they admit it is injurious, they cannot, after a time, differentiate, differentiate the two from the false. And then I also had restless, irritable, and discontented, which David, you were almost on, you almost hit it, hit the nail with a hammer on that one. Um, they are restless, which is offering no physical or emotional rest, irritable, easily angered, discontented, uneasiness of the mind, unless they can again experience the sense of ease and comfort, which comes at once by taking a few drinks. Drinks, which they see others taking with impunity, without consequences. Um, and then just some other words reiterated from the last time. Uh, phenomena, phenomenon uh, is a rare event. Craving, abnormal desire as for a drug or I put in parentheses alcohol. Um, so after they have succumbed to the desire again, as so many do, the rare event of craving, abnormal desire as for drug alcohol develops. They pass through the well-known stages of a spree emerging remorseful with a firm resolution not to drink again. And then uh, I have two definitions. I'm surprised that David actually didn't um, talk about his definition of psychic, which is um, the head, the heart, and the attitude. Uh, the, I think maybe you'll get into it if you want to, but um, it is also described in the 1938 dictionary as the soul, the human soul. So this is repeated over and over again, unless this person can experience an entire soul change, there's very little hope for his recovery. Thank you, Sam. So as I look at that paragraph, I'm going to take this statement, I'm going to turn it into a, a question. And as David started uh, right after the word impunity, top of the page, it says, I would just take it and put it in first person. David, if, when you just succumb to the desire again, which you're talking about the obsession, without my permission, without my consent, I pick up a drink. And, and you watch other people do the same thing. And do you break out in this phenomenon of craving? Does that develop in you? Once you take a drink, can you control the amount that you drink? So before the desire, again, talking about choice, and now we're talking about control, David, you pass through a well-known stages of a spree, like you're on, it's going. I, once I start, once a pickle, always a pickle. Do you come out of that rem emerging remorseful with firm, firm resolution not to drink again? David pointed it out. I promise my wife, did I mean it? I would have passed a lie detector test. You know what the worst thing I ever did to my wife and my kids? I wasn't ever physically abusive to them. I mean, I threatened many times, but I didn't do it. The worst thing I ever did wasn't 
losing a job, wasn't stealing from them, wasn't lying to them constantly, have, having an affair with alcohol and cocaine right, right under her nose. The worst thing I ever did was I stole her hope. I continually stole her hope over and over and over again with that firm resolution that I would never do this again. And I would convince her and I would convince me of the lie that I could do that on my own power. I cannot do this on my own power. I proved that to me over and over and over again. And because then it says, this is repeated over and over. And as David said, there's continue to the overs as many want to put in that sentence. Unless you get a person can have an entire psychic change. Carl Jung talks about what this uh, uh, entire psychic change looks like. Ideas, emotions, and attitudes. Those things need to change. What are those? Change, change, and change. All those things have to change. Can I do that on my own power? No, I can't. I, if I could, if I wouldn't I have done that a long time ago. And if I can't do it on my own power, then because of me, I'm not going to be able to do this. I'll have very little hope of my recovery. I will continue this path until I either get locked up or covered up. Or I can come to a place where I can see to my innermost self that I'm a real alcoholic because someone qualified me. And then I get busy to do this work. Then I can have the entire psychic change. Then my life will never look the same again. Yeah. So I purposefully didn't want to get into there, Sam, because I was afraid I was going to go too far afield. But yeah, psychic change, a change of the psyche. What is the psyche? It's really the wholeness, the totality of, of our sort of mental being, right? And so, you know, I, I talk about it as a, the sum of the, my thoughts, my feelings, and my attitudes, but more on that much, much later. On the other hand, and strange as this may seem to those who do not understand, once a psychic change has occurred, the very same person who seemed doomed, who had so many problems he despaired of ever solving them, suddenly finds himself easily able to control his desire for alcohol, the only effort necessary being that required to follow a few simple rules i have the definition for doomed which is unhappy fate hence ruin and death so the very person who seemed doomed with the unhappy fate hence ruin or death who had had so many problems he despaired of ever solving them suddenly finds himself easily able to control his desire for alcohol so once I have the psychic change the doctor's talking about here, it has occurred, and a lot of people don't understand it. The very same person who seemed doomed at one time, a hopeless variety of a drunk like myself, suddenly finds himself easily able to control the desire for alcohol. Safe and protected, as I talked about in the 10th step. What am I having here? Alcoholics Anonymous, AA stands for Alcoholics Anonymous. It also stands for attitude adjustment. I have an attitude adjustment, meaning my emotional sobriety. And how I react and how I respond to things are differently than I've ever been before if I live in the disciplines of 10, 11, and 12. And I know I'm jumping ahead, but it's so important for me to understand the hope and what that looks like for me on a daily basis living in 10, 11, and 12. And because of that, then I don't have to struggle because this happens for me automatically here. And then it says at the very bottom, the only effort necessary is bring that, being that required to follow a few simple rules. Well, Bill's not saying this. The doctor's saying this. Yeah, there's some rules, and they're simple, and they're called the 12 steps. And I don't have the ability to work all them things on my own anyways. God will give me the ability to work each and every step as we go along the way, because I don't know about you, but the steps on the wall look like to me I need to go out and make amends to everybody right away. And that is not how this works, because I don't have the power to do that. Each step is linked together for a reason, and then the power will come flowing in. I'll have access to that power, and then I'll be able to do this work, and uh, I, will, I will have the psychic change. It happens for everyone who does this work. There's no failure. Yeah, thorough and honest in our approach. There is no failure. And, and a lot of what we're talking about here at the end of the last paragraph and this paragraph, again, without going too far forward, don't go there now, but make a note. Take a look at page 27, 26 and 27 later, which is the story of Roland Hazard working with Carl Jung. And it talks about what it looks like how a psychic change occurs. We, so we got to explain a little bit. We don't want to go too far afield. So how do I have a psychic change where everything inside me is different, that my psyche changes? Well, I accomplish that through a spiritual awakening or spiritual experience. Okay? That affects the psychic change. And just so we understand 
Why is that relevant? Because our problem statement is the first step. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol, dashed that our lives had become unmanageable. That's the problem statement. Way on further down the line, the 12th step, that's our solution statement. Having had a spiritual awakening as the, the singular, as the result of these steps. So we understand here, I come with the problem of powerlessness, of unmanageability. I get the solution that I have a spiritual experience spiritual awakening, and I get from the problem in one to the solution in 12 by doing everything in between. Seems pretty logical, right? All in a row. Get one to two to three, etc. Do all this work thoroughly and honestly, as Dave and I were just saying. Have that spiritual awakening. The psyche changes. And I can't promise this, but I can tell you in my experience and the experience of many people I've worked with, those who work these steps thoroughly and honestly by the time you're early into those ninth step amends, your psyche is starting to change significantly. Your spiritual awakening. Guys, this is a broadening. In Bill's story, if you're familiar with it, he has this thunderbolt white light experience where God comes to him suddenly and the, and the obsession is removed from him and he's spiritually well very quickly. Most of us aren't that fortunate. By the way, We all want that. We love instant gratification. We want to be well now with minimal effort. But later, much later, there's a great appendix. Number two, the spiritual experience. It says for most of us, we don't have that experience. Most of us get better gradually. We have the educational variety of a spiritual experience. And what I can tell you is, as I work through the steps, really starting in the second step, My spiritual awakening starts to broaden, starts to widen. I don't have a waterfall or a dam bursting open experience in 12. What I have is it gets a little better in two, gets a little better in three, gets a little better, gets a lot better in four, five, six, seven, gets a tremendous amount better in eight and nine. It's a constant, gradual awakening. And this is the reason that David always harps on this too. Move swiftly with newcomers. Why do we want to wait to help people save their lives? Let's not. Let's rush to get this spiritual change. Remember, so those of you who were with us um, a few weeks ago, at 3 to the 15th power, I talked about how three, if I sponsor three people correctly and they sponsor three people correctly all through steps, and then it happens 15 times down the line, it's 14 million plus people recovered. Right? So let's hustle up. Let's do it the right way. But let's be speedy about it. Okay. Men have cried out to me in sincere and despairing appeal. Doctor, I cannot go on like this. I have everything to live for. I must stop, but I cannot. You must help me. It's almost like a frothy emotional appeal to myself. To me and to my doctor. The doctor is powerless to help me. I'm powerless to help me. And with that thought in mind, my experience wasn't that with a doctor necessarily. My experience was that with a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Because I was in a psych ward and I heard the message when this lady looked me right in the eye and told me, she goes, David, if you blame your wife for calling the police on you, you'll drink until you die. And I had that moment of clarity where God froze the liar in me just for a moment. And I did something with that against my nature that I'd never done before. I got up out of that meeting of, uh, on a psych ward and I went down to a pay phone and I called someone. I don't even know how I knew this guy's phone number by uh, God's grace. And I called a guy who was sober for a few 24 hours and I cried out to him the same way. I can't keep living like this. I got to have your help. And he told me exactly what I needed to do. I don't remember exactly what it was other than the fact he said at the very end of the conversation that you're my brother and I love you. I will help you if you let me. He, I've got to let you help me, guys. That's why I have a plethora of people in my, in my life that will help me if I let them. And I followed his directions and I followed the so, few simple rules and I started working the steps quickly, immediately. And when I started living in the disciplines of 10, 11, and 12, that's when my life started really, really changing. That's when I started having that spiritual experience today. So that was my experience was with another member of Alcoholics Anonymous. 
and they threw, they gave me triage, and then they freaking gave me the guarantee solution. Let's do the work now. Faced with this problem, if a doctor is honest with himself, I'm just thinking, we're never going to get through all this tonight, so we're going to read this paragraph again next week, I can already tell. Faced with this problem, if a doctor is honest with himself, he must sometimes feel his own inadequacy. One feels that something more than human power is needed to produce the essential psychic change. Can you get essential for us, Sam? Though the aggregate of recoveries resulting from psychiatric effort is considerable, we physicians must admit we have made little impression upon the problem as a whole. Many types do not respond to the ordinary psychological approach. Why don't you start us, David? So although he gives all that he has in him is often not enough. So he's faced with the problem if a doctor is honest with himself, so all doctors need to be honest with themselves, then they can't fix me. A pill's not going to work on this. If they're, I think today in 2023, they're well-educated on what we have, that we have this mind, body, and spirit. That's what we suffer from. And they may not know anything about alcoholics and honest, but come on, guys. I mean, you shake your tree, your family tree, and an alcoholic or drug addict is going to find out. You know, I told you my experience with going to my doctor, and her brother-in-law was an alcoholic, and I got an opportunity to uh, work with him for a short period of time. So one feels that something more than human power is needed to produce this essential psychic change. Essential. Like, this is life or death, right? This is vital. Life-giving, life-saving. Through the aggregate of recoveries resulting from the psychic effort is considerable. We physicians must admit we have little impression upon the problem as a whole. Many types do not respond to the ordinary psychological approach. You're not going to fit. I, I sat on couches since I was five years old mm. talking about my problems. Honest to God, I'm not kidding you. I started going to a psychologist when I was five years old because of my behavior. And nothing got resolved when it came to. The only thing that ever came out of that whole thing was about five years before I got sober, I was going to a psychologist. Mm. And he asked me if he could write a thesis on me because he was getting his doctorate. And I said, oh, of course you could write a thesis on me. What better subject could you possibly write about? Me. And then when I got sober, I went back to him and he goes, dude, I wrote about that because I wanted to show how the alcoholic is just a liar, constantly lying in the grips of this disease. I can never stop lying. I was lying right to him the whole entire time. And I was believing the lie. He never could help me. He always said to me, you need to find a meaning of alcoholics and items. Get yourself a big book sponsor. And I finally did that when I got a place. I didn't die. And I didn't get locked up. Well, I got locked up, but I didn't die. And I made it in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I got sobered up. And I like this way, our way of living. Go ahead, Sam. Sorry, I jumped ahead of you. No, you're fine. Um, I have inadequate, it, oh my goodness, inadequacy, essential in aggregate. Um, inadequacy is insufficiency. So faced with this problem, if a doctor is honest with himself, he must sometimes feel his own insufficiency. And then essential is necessary. One feels that something more than human power is needed to produce this necessary psychic change in aggregate, a mass of individuals. So though the... Um, aggregate mass of individuals of recoveries resulting from psychiatric effort is considerable, we physicians must admit we have made little impression impression upon the problem as a whole. Look at the humility of what this doctor is saying. Do you guys know any doctors? And I'm allowed to take pot shots because my mom's a retired doctor and my dad was in medical education. Where's Ashton? Yeah, there's my friend Ashton. Yeah, work with a lot of doctors. How many humble doctors do you know? I can count on one hand, right? But this is what makes them good. They got lots of opinions. They got strong minds. They save our lives. What is this little doctor who loved drunk saying? He's saying, if a doctor is honest with himself, he must sometimes feel his inadequacy. I go to lots of doctors. 
because I'm, I'm, I'm all busted up and I'm diabetic and I got all these things wrong with me. I don't run into many doctors who feel inadequate. They have a treatment plan. They got a medication. They got a course of action. And by the way, David is bang on. I'm sure he and I are not the only ones here who, who went to, to therapy prior to getting sober. What a colossal waste of time and money. But I'll tell you what was an amazing investment of time and money was when I went back to therapy a couple years of sobriety under recovery under my belt. But this doctor saying, if I'm honest, when trying to help alcoholics, sometimes I feel inadequate, despite all my experience and all of my training. I don't want to simplify some of this highbrow and old-fashioned language. Because one feels that something more than human power is needed to produce the essential psychic change. So essential, must have, psyche, everything, the wholeness of my mind, the inside of me, has got to change, has got to alter, and it can't be done from a human power. No human being, not my wife, not my kids, not my parents, not the judge, the doctor, the lawyer, the jailer, the warden. No human can do it. And though the aggregate of recovery, so they're saying, if we sum up all the alcoholics that psychiatrists have helped, they're saying that's a good number. It's considerable. But we physicians, we doctors have to admit we've made little impression. So we've, we've helped a bunch of alcoholics through psychiatry, but it's only a tiny fraction of the entire problem of all the people that need help. Many types do not respond to the ordinary psychological approach. You know the types that often do respond to the ordinary psychological approach? And the book talks about these two. There's the concept of the heavy drinker, the hard drinker. They're not real alcoholics. They look like us a lot of times. They drink like us a lot of times. But they're not suffering from the physical, the mental, and the spiritual illnesses in total. They may have one of those. They may have a couple of them. And we're going to talk about this more because this comes up a few times in the book. Those heavy drinkers, those hard drinkers, when faced with a significant problem, health issue, right, ruining their liver, wife or husband threatened to leave them, kids getting taken away, going to lose that job, going to lose that home, they can stop or moderate. And by the way, I got a collection of buddies that were all heavy drinkers, hard drinkers. They're all they're still my best friends today. The seven of us are texting all day long, right? We were college buddies. We were all in a fraternity together. We hit it hard. Woo, did we hit it hard. And we hit it hard for a long time. And guess what happened to these guys, these heavy drinkers, when they got into their late 20s? They stopped. They moderated. They got married. They had kids. They got promotions. They were not real alcoholics. And God bless that, right? I was just doing enough real alcoholism and real addiction for the group of us. So many types, real alcoholics, simply don't respond to the ordinary psychological approach. It's a perfect place to stop there. Summer, did we have any questions that we missed in the chat along the way? We do not. Okay, I'm going to kill the recording then. <laughs>